Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it is my pleasure to have Dr. Deanna Minnick with us. Deanna is a health educator, researcher, and author with more than 20 years of experience in nutrition, mind-body health, medical science, and functional medicine. Her passion is bringing forth a colorful, whole self approach to nourishment and bridging the gaps between science, soul, and art in medicine. Her website, DeannaMinnick.com, and Facebook page are great places for you to go for more information about her. Deanna, it's so great to have you on the show. Yeah, it's a delight to be here with you, Stefan. So you were a guest on my wife's show on Orion's uh, podcast, which is Stellar Life Podcast, and I'm really excited to have you on this show now. You guys had such a powerful and, and uh valuable informational conversation. So we're going to go into some uh, other more esoteric topics uh, as well as you know, what you're most known for is eating the rainbow and the color, uh, the different colors of the foods that you, you intake have uh, different effects on your biology and so forth. So we'll definitely do some of that, but we're going to get kind of you know, a, a little bit woo-woo in this episode too. So first of all, I'd love to start off by hearing <laughs> your your origin story how did you end up becoming an expert in in uh, this area around you know eating the rainbow and and uh, you know the, the the different kinds of n nutrients that are in whole foods well i think it started with my mom saying to me when i was eight years old that the whiter the bread the quicker you're dead and it was really my parents, especially my mother, who created this journey for me because she really woke up to health, to food, to Richard Simmons, to Adele Davis in the 1970s. And I was just, you know, a seven, eight, nine year old. And I was taking all of this in. And to me, it seemed very emotionally, uh, I would say, polarizing. It was very difficult for me to wrap my head around that. So I pushed against it hard. I had an eating disorder in my teens. And then I went on to study science as an undergraduate. And so I studied science, but I was also very intrigued with philosophy and with English literature. And I minored in English lit. So with all of my electives were in taking courses like uh, studying Emily Dickinson, studying Walt Whitman. And so I, I really had that feeling of connecting to well, we, we might say left brain, right brain, but I don't even know if those hemispheric designations are even accurate anymore. I think it's just more or less really seeing that there's there's more. There's more than just science as a method. And I was intrigued. I, I took my first yoga class when I was 19. I began to take other more esoteric classes like world religions, philosophy of language. I started reading different books that I hadn't grown up with. So then I went into graduate school. I continued my study of nutrition, of all things, especially when I was so, um, I would say, against my mother's push to have healthy food in the house. I, I ended up going to study it and going pretty deep. So I spent three years during my undergraduate, or I'm sorry, four years undergraduate, three years graduate school. Then I went on for my PhD, going even further, looking at nutrition. So I guess I... I I'm a little bit of an all or nothing person where, you know, if I'm going to really get into something, I want to immerse. And I, I think that for everybody's origin story, there's some component of personal healing for them. And side by side with all of my study, I also had a lot of health conditions. And most of those revolved around my reproductive tract. So my, uh, you know, I had endometriosis. I had a blocked fallopian tube. These kinds of issues ran in my my paternal family line, so um, I was constantly coming up against. Okay, I need to find a different modality. I need to look under the hood. I need to look at other things to facilitate my healing. And maybe not everything is food oriented. So I think that side by side with my study of science, there was also the art of healing taking place in my own personal life. So you mentioned. Uh, some reproductive issues like uh, are, are you working with clients now who are facing reproductive issues and helping them to get past those 
You know, it's really interesting you mentioned that because um, it, it's true. Somehow there is some kind of gravitational pull to people who have like issues, whether energetic, physical, emotional, mental. And I would say that in some way, um, bringing creativity into all that I do has been part of my mission in the world. So bringing that through color, through art, through healing. And yes, I think that much of my work does really connect with women who have similar type of struggles. So I, I do feel like it's, it's really wonderful to be able to show them a different way into working with uh, their bodies. So how might that work? Like what would be uh, a regimen of, of uh, um, health um, supplements, modalities and things that would uh, address uh, a, a woman's reproductive um, difficulties? Like what would, what would be uh, a protocol that, or maybe even give an example, anonymized example of somebody that, that had a breakthrough because of your work with them? Well, I, I really do think it's about all forms of healing, whether we're a man, a woman, um, you know, just however we identify with our gender. I do think that healing comes in many different forms. And so often we hear that food is medicine, people focus on nutrition. And then when a certain dietary approach doesn't work, then they they have to figure out, oh, what what food should I be having or what sh what food should I let go of? You know, is there an allergy component? So I do think that healing is like an onion. So we start with the parts that are more physical. And that's where a lot of my training took me. And that's where a lot of my personal journey took me was looking at my nutrition because that, that was also my upbringing was to look at the foods that I was eating. I think that the other aspect of being physical about our healing process is looking at phys physical activity, looking at motion, looking at flow, looking at how we are, how active we are in the world, right? So like moving our skeleton, our, our muscles, you know, just the structural elements. Then I also think that there are the mental, emotional facets of our being that do need to be addressed in the healing journey. And that for me, um, especially with um, my particular health issues, and I think for anybody with any health issue, we need to be looking at emotions and how are those emotions at play? Because I know that for myself, if I'm not expressing my emotions, if I'm not allowing myself to be in that space, somehow my body starts to signal back to me and it becomes the messenger for what I most need to address. And those symptoms come through loudly. So one of the ways that I helped to work with what I had, in addition to everything else that I was doing, I was doing dietary supplements, I was doing body work, chiropractic, I was doing acupuncture, my goodness, you know, I was doing energy medicine, I was doing Reiki, I was having uh, medical intuitives read me as to what was going on. And it was like a big kaleidoscope. So having all of these different portals into my own healing process. And I think that as part of that journey, I learned a lot about myself, I learned a lot about healing modalities, I learned a lot about healing in general, what is healing? you know, the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, energetic aspects of healing. But I think for me, what really worked quite well in terms of my own health issues, reproductive or otherwise, was getting into the space of the mental, emotional through the conduit of color and art. So what I began to do, especially in my late 20s and into my early 30s, was I started to paint. And I began to paint with bright colors, just amorphous, chaotic shapes. So nothing that was, you know, like I was trying to paint a, a house or a lake or a village. It was simply a splash of color on the canvas in order to get out of me whatever needed to be communicated to the external realm. And I began painting certain colors, certain shapes. And I, I would like to give credit to my husband, who was actually the one that stepped back and said, Deanna, I'm seeing a theme to your paintings. You're painting your ovaries, your uterus, you're putting them all over our house. And I, <laughs> it was interesting because I hadn't quite seen that there was a pattern to what I was painting. But once 
somebody was able to witness that for me, specifically my husband, then I felt like, oh, maybe my body is needing to express in ways that go beyond words. Maybe I need color. Maybe for me, color is medicine. Color is what is healing. I'm missing color like a nutrient in my life. So that's what helped me. And, you know, I think everybody's different. It's not like there's a protocol. I, I don't think that, you know, there are some basics of good living. So eating colorful foods, moving every day, hydrating, sleeping well, relating well, relaxing well, all of those things. And I do think that whatever we're drawn to, whatever we're most curious about, is probably where we need to take our energy and move into. Yeah. Now you, uh, you probably are familiar with the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. I am. Yeah. It's a good book. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the concept of the issues are in the tissues that there's an emotional or even spiritual root to all the physical ailments and diseases and, and chronic pain that we're experiencing. I'd love to hear more about that and specifically what you found your, like you got all this benefit from having your health challenges and that it, it connected you to your mission and gave you all this raw material to work with to help heal all these other people. Uh, and now there, for example, are babies in the world um, that wouldn't have been here if you hadn't have worked with uh, those particular clients who are having those reproductive issues, uh, as an example. So our, your, your ripple effect, uh, is huge, right? That's so much more than you might even imagine. So I'm curious to hear what would be the kind of the main learnings that you got beyond like, okay, this got me connected to my mission and gave me all this, um, uh, great, uh, focus on, uh, on what I'm doing now, but like, why did it even show up beyond that? Like, what was, what was the emotional or spiritual root of, of the health issues you, you had been facing? It's a good question. It's a really good question. And by the way, I don't even know if what I have done with the rainbow diet or my art has led to more fertile women and women making peace per se. Um, you know, sometimes I hear anecdotally that there is an aha moment for them. So I think that that's great, but I never want to give credit for anybody's healing. I do think that everybody is really connected into their own healing path. And, uh, you know, we're just, um, people by the, <laughs> by the side of the road and kind of cheering them on and doing what we can to support them. So, you know, there's that, but you're asking a really deep question. You're asking, you know, what is the, the spiritual aspect of you coming into this life and really being connected to color, to art, to having these issues? I do think that for me as a woman in science, it had been very challenging in some respects to always be on the defense, to always live within my mind, to be within the intellect and to use my brain I would say more than my body or my heart. And, and I, I do think that that whole journey into color was about me opening up into my more full, colorful, even authentic self, that there was something really, there was something deep that was missing. And so through that process, I became much more integrated in my way of thinking and in my way of feeling and in other words really bridging together science and spirituality and I, I, you know i think for many practitioners that are out there many of them are really focused on protocols on um, different aspects to healing do they know enough do they need another certificate do they need another degree and what i think we most miss in healing is the art, is the intuition, is the holding of space, is this element of really being creative. And, and that's really, you know, I, I, I got turned on to more of this creative path just by way of my own ailments and then moving out of them through making sure that I was being creative. And I, I think we need to be creative about what it means to be creative. 
because many people will say, oh, I'm not an artist, I'm not creative. But in their mind, what they think of as creative might actually be very limited. It might be literally, you know, a, a poet or somebody who makes their life as a musician and that's their livelihood. I think creativity can be little micro steps of being creative. It can be being creative in the kitchen with one meal. It can be creative um, on the way to work in the morning by listening to different musical pieces or taking a different way to work. It could be talking to different people, reading different books. It could be um, breaking out of your routine in whatever routine you have. And so I do think we need to be creative about being creative. And in doing that, we start to open up this whole kaleidoscope of all the many different facets of who we are. And we begin to explore that. So I always remember that, like when I need to heal and when I have a symptom mm. or a condition, my default now is to expand rather than contract into it so that I can get the benefit of looking big, broad, and in a very creative way as to what I most may, what I may most need in that moment. Mm hmm I love what you said about being creative, about being creative. We put ourselves in such boxes. I used to think of myself as not very creative because I couldn't draw or paint. Uh, I, I was never really uh, that um, talented at, at music. So I just, you know, kind of shelved that side of, of me and worked on all the left brain stuff, studied biochemistry in, in college and yeah, studied bi uh, biochemistry and, uh, as a um, graduate student and I just kind of shut off my uh, creative side. But now I'm recognizing how creative I, I really am, even if I'm not a painter or a musician. Yeah, you know, it's have, it, it's true, you know, creativity in my bones. Well, and um, I think for many people who are in science, like when you said that you studied biochemistry, sometimes the way to get to this place of being creative and even um, tapping into one's spirituality is through science, is through something that we would consider more left brain, something more logical. Uh, I hear that from other scientists where you know, you see the, the beauty, the mystery of nature and how things are put together and how, you know, you try to reduce it and simplify it. And it you in, in doing that, it's almost like it unlocks further mystery. And, uh, you know, there's there's something really big in what is small. So I really like to do that, you know, connecting the physical to the spiritual connecting the micro to the macro, because I do think it gives people perspective, even in their healing journey. If we can look at the smaller things that are happening to us in life and then zoom out and look at, well, what is kind of like what you said to me, like, hey, Deanna, what, what was the bigger mission, the bigger aspect of you getting sick? What was that really about? I think when we do that, we ratchet up and out of our physical constraints and we move into more of the mystical, spiritual aspects of, wow, what is our soul here to do? How are we growing? Yeah, such an important question. And, and so what would be some practical things you could offer our listener who maybe isn't that into spirituality or, you know, they don't want to necessarily have conversations with God like Neil Donald Walsh but they're, uh, they're, they're wanting to be their best selves and be a good person in the world. And, you know, they, they like science and they like stuff that's provable and tangible. Um, what would be some practical advice that you would offer them that helps them to bridge science and spirituality? Yeah, well, and, and Stefan, I think first we have to define what is spirituality because um, I don't necessarily see it as a conversations with God aspect. Uh, spirituality to me is that sense of feeling that you're a part of something bigger. 
So there's a sense of meaning of one's life. There's a sense of purpose. Uh, in the scientific literature, there's a term transcendence, which I really like, where we take ourselves out of ourselves and we give of ourselves in the act of um, maybe service or, you know, again, we get a different perspective. So the way that I define spirituality is perhaps a bit more lifestyle oriented and it's much more about how we think, what is our philosophy, what is our belief system, how do we interact with the the planet, with with the the universe, the cosmos, the 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 entire aspect of um, everything that we have physical knowing of. So that's kind of how I, I see it. So I, I do think that there are three principles to make spirituality practical. And I talk about them even when I'm talking about food. These are universal principles. And the first one is truly about color. I do think that color is a way for people to um, enter into a, I would, I would say it, it's almost like this, this sphere of something that is very psychologically powerful. Color can change our, our emotions. It can change our behavior. It can change our actions. So I do think that even through the presence of color in our environment, if we're in a green forest, if we're watching the blue ocean, we're in a red orange desert and really tapping into those colors, wearing certain colors can also potentially change overall just how we feel. So I do think that bringing in the element of color in whatever ways that would be, maybe it's eating from a blue plate, maybe it's drinking from a red cup. You know, there are so many ways that we can start to observe color in our environment and every color has a certain functional signature, even within foods. And when I talk about eating the rainbow, one of the ways to really wake up to something bigger and to have better mental health, to have a better mood state, and to have less anxiety and less depressive symptoms is to have more of those colors. So I think first and foremost, really coming from that place of color is, is key. And then secondly, I would say variety. That one of the ways that we can become more I would say practically spiritual is to have diversity, to have variety in all things. So that would be in our life experiences. You know, it was almost like when I was traveling a lot, I used to be on the road pretty constantly and I, I would have all these different experiences and I would become very philosophical as a result of experiencing all of these different events, meeting different people, trying different foods. It really opened my eyes to a bigger world. So I think that having varied experiences on the outside, as well as having varied experiences on the inside, we don't necessarily have to travel to have a spiritual experience. We can travel on the inside. We can get alone time and stillness. This is one of the things that I think people are really uncomfortable with, and that is being alone, having that alone time and dipping their toe into the stillness of their being. You know, there is this incessant doingness within our culture, this, you know, we, we always have to be busy, we're, we're doing, we're active, we're very young, and there isn't a lot about being yin or receiving or quieting. And we really struggle as a society, I think at large, just to do that. So I think that that's one of the ways to get a little piece of the more interconnected spiritual nature of who we are is to tap into the wholeness by, by getting really quiet on the inside. And that might, it seems like the easiest one, but it's actually one of the most challenging for people. People usually want to do something there. They'll say, Deanna, what do I need to do? Do I need a glass of water in the morning? Do I need to do yoga? What do I need to do? And uh, I would say perhaps we need to undo. We need to get into that space of the, the quiet within each of us in order to, uh, to really tap into our creative spirit and to see what comes out. You know, some of the best ideas I get are in those moments of quiet. Yeah. Mm, yep. Yep. You're tapped in, <clears throat> tapped into the field. Now you mentioned uh, variety as being a key aspect to this, um, this three-pronged um, approach. And it 
reminded me of a book I read decades ago called How to Be a People Magnet. And the idea in that book that really stuck with me is uh, uh, scrambling, which is getting outside your comfort zone, doing something that you would not mm. normally do or want to do as an activity just to try it so that you have a more diverse set of experiences and, and um, activities that you can use as uh, bridge builders with different uh, people, you know, different, uh, different strokes for different folks, right? So I have no interest in golf, <laughs> absolutely none. But if I at least try it a few times, and then have uh, some interesting experiences, epiphanies, um, uh, learning uh, lessons from it, then somebody who's an avid golfer, I can have a, a meaningful conversation with instead of just talking about the weather or uh, the, the recent news. So people uh, are interested in you if you're interested in them, right? Mm. So you, in order to be interesting, you need to be interested. And so if I'm going to talk to a golfer, uh, I should have some sort of fodder to work with in, in, in that person's um, uh, area of passion. So I like that. I like that a lot. And, you know, I, I think um, – being curious leads us to uh, a more creative approach as well. And, and I love learning. You know, I do a lot of teaching, but in order for me to teach, I need to immerse myself in learning. And so anything that gets us out of our ruts, and if we're in a food rut, rut where we're eating the same thing every day, chances are we're in a life rut where we're doing the same things every day. So I think anything that gets us to flow neuronally, is good for the brain. Anything that gets just to flow in the heart gets to um, change those emotional fluxes. And then anything that changes the gut, making sure that we've got new foods coming in, that we're changing up the foods that we're taking in in order to better fortify the gut microbiome. I think that all of that is, is really key. Diversity is one of the principles of nature. So I like what you said about being interested because it allows us to tap into things that we may know nothing about, and so we continue to learn. We continue to flow. We inspire and spark the nerves, the heart, the gut, and that may generate different behaviors. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Now, um, this idea of if you're in a food rut, it shows up as a life rut. I love certain foods that I'll just, you know, get in this pattern of m making all the time. I don't really enjoy cooking. So if I've mastered something, let's say, uh, how to make an avocado shake, right? It's an avocado and, and uh, uh, half an English cucumber, a peeled lemon, um, some spinach, and uh, some almond milk and some water and you know, optionally a little bit of stevia to sweeten it, but I don't, I don't sweeten mine. I can make that day after day. <laughs> <laughs> it's super healthy and there's only one color there. It is so boring. It's healthy, but it's green. And I know, I know that people are like all about many people well, you'll hear they're like okay you need to eat more greens right plant whole food whole, uh, plant uh, based diet lots more greens but what i hear from you that's different is that like, you got to eat the rainbow you got to eat different colors and not just lots of of greens and and my understanding of that is pretty rudimentary i know that there are certain um uh, antioxidants in in different uh, fruits and vegetables and that's what gives them the color so something that's a vibrant red has a very different antioxidant uh, in it than something that's a vibrant yellow so maybe you could talk more about that and then other aspects of um, the benefits of of uh, taking in the different colors and and, and also from a metaphysical perspective, too, because I think there's an aspect there where uh, each color has a certain frequency or vibration to it. 
and you don't want to get stuck in a vibrational rut either. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Wow, that's a big um, question to unpack. Well, let's start with your smoothie. When you put that smoothie together, and you seem to have a connection with that, that it, it tastes good, you know it's healthy, and perhaps you do need something from that. And so it's not necessarily something that's unhealthy to do. So I don't discount the, the constant steady eddy staples to our daily routine. Some of us actually need a little bit of that routine in order to structure our day and to ensure that we're getting certain things. So routine being rooted, this is important for us as being human. And in fact, some of the studies would suggest that we need to do certain things at somewhat constant times throughout the day for best effects, right? So like even with meditation, um, there was a study that I remember from some years ago where you have people who meditate just on the weekend who aren't regular meditators versus people who do it on a constant basis. And of course that consistency is key for having even genetic impacts and, and changes physiologically that are much more potent. So I don't discount kind of our steady eddies. Um, what I would say is to constantly reevaluate our steady eddies and what we're doing and to have consciousness in doing that, meaning that as you put together that green juice, you are reflecting on the avocado, on the English cucumber. You know, as these things come together, you're really kind of, you're, you're tapping into the moment of how the food is connecting to your body and maybe even sensing you know, maybe uh, in, instead of a lemon, maybe a lime today, or, you know, I, I have this practice even for myself, and I talk about this as it relates to intuitive eating, walking into the kitchen, really connecting to the body, connecting to your own sense of self, your, your physical, your emotional, your mental, your spiritual needs, and kind of wrapping that up into a question of like, what do I most need right now? And seeing how you can be receptive and listen mm. into the body and go from there. So there, there's that. Um, as far as, uh, again, back to your, your concoction there, maybe even just trying out, uh, you know, perhaps once a week, a new fruit or a vegetable that goes into that particular smoothie. You know, I, I think that even trying one food, maybe it's a food that you've never had before, Maybe it's a spice, maybe it's an herb, maybe it's something that's in season that you don't typically get to have within your daily routine or your how you eat. I think that that's worthwhile because it does open our eyes. It opens up our taste buds. It really connects to the digestive tract. So viscerally, it's connecting to us on a very emotional level. Now, even within the colors, you were asking about, you know, colors and the pigments uh, within green, there is diversity. So even if we were to stay with a green juice or a green smoothie, there can be diversity amongst the green foods. And what I tend to see is that people stick to certain foods all the time. Even if they're eating the rainbow, they might actually be just eating the same foods within each of those color categories. So yes, they're getting the rainbow, but they're not getting a diverse rainbow. So let's just go with your green because there are so many green foods compared to all of the other colors. So it's easy, or at least it's easier to get a variety of different green foods compared to some of the others. So swapping out and trying out different green foods because green foods have so many different phytonutrients, uh, different families. You know, we have chlorophyll in green foods. That's what makes them green. Then you have uh, different B vitamins like folates. In some of the leafy greens, you have vitamin K. So in, in some of them, you have magnesium. And so the more diverse you can get, even within one color, you tend to get different nutrients, different arrays of nutrients. And so the literature would suggest that the more diverse we eat, the more food variety we have overall, the, the greater our nutritional status. So that's just try. it's almost like, again, art, where we have all these different paints or foods from nature with all these different pigments, and each food is very unique, and it's providing to you these different phytonutrients that are unique to its, its signature, 
and then it goes and informs yours. So that's why I think um, we need to have diversity even within the colors. And then you were asking about the metaphysical aspects of the vibration, the wavelength, and that really speaks to the, the, the pigments in these colors of food. So why are green foods green? The pigment, the wavelength, and how our bodies our mitochondria specifically, how it's breaking down those bonds for energy, those colorful bonds. You know, what's really beautiful about many of the plant foods with all the different colors is that those colors represent pigments that can capture light. So they engage in photosynthesis, harnessing that energy from the sun, bringing in that, that type of um, energy that we then break apart and then we put that into our own body's currency of ATP. So I think it's really a beautiful process if you think about it that um, our lives are run through light, through the sun. And through the sunlight, we get this full spectrum of different colors. And we, we can see the full array of these different colors within the plant kingdom. And that's not just fruits and vegetables, that would be whole grains, legumes, you know, I'm drinking here uh, green tea, you know, and I try to diversify my tea and try not, even within green tea, I try to get different kinds of green tea because sencha is different than gunpowder is different than janmai cha. I mean, you've got all the different varieties. If we're having apples, having different kinds of apples in order to get different phytochemicals. So I think all in all, you know, it's an old adage, right? You know, variety is the spice of life. And I think that variety helps to make us more resilient. And in the end, um, you know, everything your podcast is about, which is optimizing who we are at a physical, emotional, mental, and even spiritual level. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, <clears throat> there's an interesting uh, study that pops into my mind that I, I think would be uh, appropriate to bring up at this moment. I learned about it from the book Mind Matter, which is a book that uh, uh, my wife Orion is reading. And I, I only just kind of picked it up one day and started uh, uh, reading kind of randomly in the middle of it. Of course, nothing was random. <laughs> what I was led to was a case study around uh, being able to send your chi energy, your life force energy to uh, uh, let's say something that's slightly radioactive, like uh, americium. Uh, I think it was americium two forty one, two forty four, something like that. And uh, you can actually just through the power of thought and intention change the rate of decay. That is so normally precise that its half life is, I think. Uh, 422 years or something like that. And uh, there were scientifically validated reproducible studies done where um, somebody who is like a powerful meditator or energy healer could adjust that plus or minus 10%. Mm. So it's roughly, right? So I think it was 11% in the negative and uh, nine. 0.8% in the positive or something, but to be able to change the rate of decay of, uh, you know, so that's, that's modifying the, the weak force. And that's, <laughs> that's not something that can be affected by, uh, let's say strong EMFs or uh, gravitational pull or, or extreme temperatures. None of that affects the rate of decay, but our thoughts can. Mm. Uh, that's just mind blowing. That is mind blowing. So I'm curious to hear your your, your take on that. Well, I, I do think that you're onto something there when you talk about uh, intention or directing our thought energy into something. And you know, I I've seen that more in the aspects of healing. Just to give one example. Um, you know, even uh, with my father who had to have uh, hip surgery, he had to have his hip replaced. And he kept telling himself that I'm not going to need any physical therapy after this. I'm going to be walking, you know, and he went into the surgery with this mindset and he came out great and did exactly what he had set forth to do 
with no physical therapy. And I had the pleasure of even meeting the woman who would have been his physical therapist. And, you know, she was laughing, saying, you know, he didn't even need to have that additional focus. And I said, well, my dad's pretty strong in his mind. When he gets his mind on something, it's like a magnet and he magnetizes to that thought. Now, that's why we also have to look at what we're magnetizing to in our mental sphere, because there can be other things that may actually drain us. So, you know, you just gave an example of where we can use it to influence decay rate. I've seen it over and over again in the healing realm, but I do think that we can also look at it on the other side of what are our thoughts. And in fact, uh, I talk about thoughts being almost like, um, you know, nutrients, either they could be things that are highly processed that we keep running over and over again, we keep ruminating, it keeps draining our energy like an ultra processed food, or we can have a thought that acts like a nutrient or like a nutritional supplement where we take it and we feel better, we feel more optimal, we feel more uh, energy from it. So to really follow how we feel when we're thinking certain thoughts, and that is a tough one because Thoughts feel kind of like they're out here, right? They don't feel like they're internal to the point that we can control them. And that's where things like meditation and physical activity, having a lot of these mind-body practices can be really important for corralling the mind, making sure that we focus and we harness our thoughts where we really want them to go long-term and what kind of end result we would like. Hmm. Yeah, this is such an important uh, point. I, I wanted to piggyback on that by saying that when you're eating uh, something really nutrient-dense versus eating something processed and uh, you know straight out of box, <laughs> which I have to admit, I eat way too much processed food, um, I at least have the intention and the, uh, <clears throat> the discipline of praying over my mm. food. Now, I may not remember to do it before I eat it, but maybe while I'm eating it or even after I eat it, then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to uh, send blessings to the food and also be thankful for it and uh, transmute it, right? So you can do this with uh, uh, anything that you're consuming, food, drink, even, uh, you know, something that I'm, I'm not going to say the word because it gets you censored, but begins with a V uh, and rhymes with axine. <laughs> uh, you can even transmute. I have a spiritual teacher who got, uh, who got it, and he was praying uh, and transmuting it while it was being injected. And I believe that's um, uh, very effective and powerful, like whatever you're consuming. So uh, there's also studies done. So this is not just mm -hmm. woo-woo. It's scientifically validated. Dr. Emoto did all these water experiments with crystallizing water and uh, beforehand putting labels on the jars of water that had things like love and peace and joy versus hatred, apathy, um, you know, all, all sorts of negative uh vibrationally negative uh, words and the ugly crystals that formed from the water that was uh, you know, labeled with something ugly like apathy yeah. or disgust versus the ones that were beautiful because they had the words joy or love or peace um, on, on the label. It's scientifically reproducible. It's really amazing. So absolutely this works. When you pray over the food, in fact, I um, started doing this just in the last year or so, uh, inspired by my sister-in-law, who is she's uh, very religious, um, like uh, or Orthodox uh, Judaism, and and she always prays over her food, like before she even touches it or eats it, you know, so. I'll forget and I'll do it while I'm eating it. Uh, she's she's very strict about that, but I, I think it really makes a difference to um, 
vibrationally send this out to the, the stuff that you're consuming. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I grew up Catholic, and I remember that one of the things that we always did was we would say grace before we ate. And I, I like the idea of having a ritual mm. connected to food and eating because it sets the tone. It places the energy in a higher place, if you will. So like emotionally, it's it's up. Mentally, it's up. Spiritually, it's up. You know, and physically, it kind of gets your body anchored. So I do think that grace or saying some kind of blessing or giving thanks. I mean, the science of gratitude is um, is definitely out there. And so I think it's it's like a value add to meditating. So if we meditate and then or pray and we're bringing in a lot of gratitude or appreciation, I feel like that is yeah, it, it's it's almost like that gratitude is a magnet for more things to be grateful for. You can't go wrong with having gratitude. It puts your body into, I, I believe, a more heart resonant state where the heart rate, the, the parasympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system, these feel more in balance and in alignment if you believe that you are grateful and you're expressing that. So, um, and to me that, you know, from, um, I, I talk about the seven systems of health, which align to the chakra system. They're not identical, but they, they definitely have similar placement. And when I think of the medicine of gratitude or appreciation, I reflect on the heart. I reflect on the love, what I call the love system of health, which is the heart, the lungs, the vasculature, the arms, the hands, you know, when we go to hug somebody wrapping our arms around them you know this is an extension of the heart field and i you know for some time you might find this uh, kind of mm -hmm. funny too because for some time i would eat out of a bowl that was shaped like a heart so i found it in the store it was a red bowl with a pink mm -hmm. inner lining and so and i really liked it because it wasn't that big it was if you put your two hands together and imagine a flap over your hands it's been said that that's more or less the, the size of the stomach that is unique to you. And so this bowl was like perfectly shaped. It was aligned to my stomach. <laughs> it was, and so, and it reminded me every time I ate, when I would see that heart shape to bring in appreciation. That was like the, the special vital force that I was bringing to the meal. And uh, really thinking about all the different beings and animals and aspects of nature that truly go into a meal. If you think about it, it's really profound. You know, just even looking down at the plate, looking at one meal can mm -hmm. take you into more of a spiritual mindset. And again, spiritual meaning feeling connected, feeling part of a great whole, feeling your smallness amongst the greatness of the bigness. And that's what a meal can do because you look down at your plate. Even if I think of my plate this morning, I think about the water element. I think about the fire element that I use to cook the food. I think about the community element. I think about the growing. I think about, you know, it's summertime now and thinking about the interplay of elements and how traditionally making sure that those elements were in balance in our food, in our environment, and also in our bodies, that that led to alignment and health and healing and optimization. Whereas having a misalignment or an imbalance of one of those elements, you know, one of the things I posted recently on my Facebook page was about, essentially it was about the fire element. So when people overcook their foods, or let's just say that they're toasting, they're grilling, they're frying, they're browning, they're broiling, you know, it's summertime. So people tend to have more barbecues and, um, that brings in a lot of the fire element and it's already very warm and it's very hot in some places. So with that imbalance, what we do is we actually create more inflammation in the body. So we get more of the fire element in the body when we're bringing it into our cooking. So we can look at health in a very elemental framework, much like in Ayurveda or even in traditional Chinese medicine, where there is this acknowledgement of the elements and how the elements on the outside need to be in balance on our inside. And we can do that through food, making sure that we have enough water and hydration, fire, air, um, earth, and even proper use of metal that we have through cookware. 
Right. So that would be my maybe uh, in the form of iron rich foods or um, getting getting enough zinc in your diet, that sort of stuff. Sure. And even uh, to reduce the amount of heavy metals that we might be taking in through mercury, methyl mercury sources or mm -hmm. high arsenic through things like rice or chicken things like that. So yes, there are many different interpretations of how we could look at metals. But yeah, I like what you said about minerals because minerals, essential minerals that we need like calcium, selenium, zinc, iron, magnesium, these essentially compete with their very, uh, I, I would say, chemical lookalikes, the heavy metals, things like arsenic and lead and cadmium and mercury, just to name a few. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's, let's switch to lightning round for the last few minutes. Uh, we'll just do like a one minute per answer. Uh, just quick, you know, I have probably three or four, uh, things I want to ask you about and then we'll wrap. Okay. So first off, uh, your upbringing, you know, raised Catholic, uh, told, as an eight-year-old that the whiter the bread the quicker you're dead i mean that seems a little stark a little maybe traumatizing and i'm curious uh how how did you receive that was it traumatizing to you or was it like oh, i take it all in stride and what you know water off a duck's back sort of thing you know uh, back to your original point about like why did you have this path i think that my parents were excellent parents from the perspective of guiding me and saying things to me in order to move me to where I most needed to be. I think at the time, I didn't understand it. It could have even been emotionally traumatizing in some respect. But then as I got older, I realized this is great. I mean, it really ties into everything that I'm doing. And I really like the fact that my mom took, I think it was Adele Davis's wisdom about the whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead kind of a thing, right? I, I just think it's, um, it informed my path. So I do think that, uh, you know, I made the best of it and um, really grateful to have had that experience. I mean, you may perceive it as stark and maybe at the time, you know, it, it had to evoke those emotions from me in order to catapult me in a certain direction. Yeah. Well, everything's for our highest and best good. I mean, I was raised by uh, a grandfather who was a converted Catholic and a uh, grandmother who, who was a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, they couldn't agree on anything pretty much. <laughs> so uh, that that launched me in, into agnosticism, <laughs> almost atheism, because I'm like, this is all bunk. Uh, you know, there, there, there is no stability in that. Anyway, so uh, let's move on to the next question, which is, in, in uh, intuitive eating and and perhaps muscle testing might tie into this, like how do you, from a practical standpoint, intuitively eat? Are you using muscle testing as an example, which is, you know, was popularized in the book uh, Power Versus Force by uh, Dr. Doc, uh, Richard Hawkins? Uh, or is it, um, you know, more of a, uh, you know, kind of a gut feel sort of thing. Like, does this instinctively seem like the right thing to eat or not? Or is there some other process to this? Well, I think if you're asking about for myself, because I think everybody has their own method of intuitive eating, but I would say for myself, it's about being in communication, open communication with my body. And if something it keeps coming up for me, let's just say like I keep craving pomegranate, well, then I, I begin to feel that perhaps I need to get some pomegranate next time I go to the store, right? I, you kind of have to filter the impulses that you get because things can be instinctual and impulsive. They can also be intuitive where they kind of come in in a different way. And I do think that the language of those two things can be a little bit different. So if you keep craving chocolate cake and intellectually you know, like, no, I I definitely should not be eating chocolate cake for various reasons, but maybe chocolate cake could symbolize something intuitively. It may s symbolize celebration. It may s s symbolize some kind of gathering or being amongst community, or maybe that um, somebody's birthday is coming up. So, you know, we can look at food as kind of a divining rod into 
you know, I would say more symbolism, more, you know, it just depends how we want to look into it. But I think in the moment, for me, it's like when things come up time and time again, and I'm kind of feeling like I'm connecting to that, and it, it, has, it has a good feeling in my body when I reflect on it. Mm, yeah. Okay. Last, uh, really quick question. Um, ha have you, uh, studied or looked at color blindness? Cause mm. you're so interested in color and that seems like a, uh, kind of a North star for you. Well, what about people who are color blind? Like there's gotta be some sort of emotional or spiritual route to that particular, uh, illness or, or, um, genetic disorder. So I'm curious about that. Yeah. You know, there's a great, um, podcast episode on, uh, looking at how all the different animals in nature have different perceptions of color, like dogs, I think can't, um, you know, instead of three cones, they only have two cones. Then you look at, uh, like there's a shrimp that I think uh, the manatee shrimp has like 16 cones, you know, butterflies can see ultraviolet things, of that nature, right? I think that, um, however, we are seeing is is really what frames our reality. And I do think that um, my grandmother developed blindness. I, I never got to know her, but she developed blindness from an illness. And I think uh, for her, it was very frustrating because she wasn't born with that sense of being blind. So she knew what it was to see, and then didn't have that later. So I I, I do think what happens for people either blind from birth or who become blind later, or maybe even have color blindness is we adapt. We need to somehow bring our other senses to the foreground and we might be more astute in hearing. I know um, when I hear from my, my mother stories about my grandmother, it was like, you know, I think that her, her hearing became more of her tentacle into the world, right? So we just have to figure out, um, you know, we, we have senses. Some would say that we have five senses. Maybe we have more, depending on how we develop them. I think that the skin is a very interesting sense. We have the sense of touch, um, but there could be many layers of our senses. And so, um, you know, color is just one. And I, I've read this, and I have not actually talked with somebody who's blind who has stated this, but I have read that people who are blind, some of them can actually feel color like they get an actual sensation or impression of color beyond vision. So I don't know if that's true. I think it's an interesting concept and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'd be nice to actually put that to the test and that would be easy to try out. So yeah, color, color is powerful, but beyond color and vision, I think that we're talking about senses and tapping into our senses as human beings and how we relate to our physical, emotional, mental, uh, worlds. Amazing. Well, this was such a, a amazing and a fascinating conversation, and uh, you, you shared such important, powerful information. If our our listener or viewer wants to learn more from you, uh, follow you, and and uh, perhaps work with you, uh, where should they go? My website. My website has everything that they would need. So, deannaminick.com. And it's D-E-A-N-N-A-M-I-N-I-C-H. And on the, on the website, they'll see links to my social media. I have a Nourish Your Whole Self community page. I have different events. I'm doing a retreat in September. So I'm really excited about doing that. It's an in-person retreat. So it'll be nice just to be in person again with people and to be doing some healing work. And then, um, of course, I have a, um, a blog. Um, and so, you know, a little bit more science-y for people who are more into the nutritional aspects of food. Uh, I do, a, I have a number of different blogs that we post there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Deanna. This was fabulous. Thank you again. And thank you, listener. Please go out there, eat the rainbow, and fill the world with your light. And we'll see you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. <laughs>